I'm Bob Doidge, and uh, I own this place, uh, the place that Bob built. Let's start with when and how you met Bob and what sparked your friendship. Okay, how I met uh, Bob Lanois yeah. was uh, I became friends with Dan Lanois in uh, probably about grade 10, and we joined a band together, and we were in a folk group at, at school, etc. And I started hanging around the house, and we were playing music down in his basement, and Bob was there, he was the older brother, and you know I knew him from there, and mm -hmm. eventually when the studio got going in the basement, then I saw a lot of him. So. Great, so you guys have been friends with the uh, Lanois oh, yeah. brothers your entire life, basically. Yeah, and my yeah. younger brother was best friends with their younger brother, Ron. Right, okay. Who, who was the chef. Right. So, so you mentioned the basement studio in, in the Ancaster house. What do you remember about that place? And tell me about the basement studio. Well, it started out, Dan and I just had two trainer mixers and a Sony tape recorder mm -hmm. and a set of speakers that we sort of made. And we were just recording for the fun of it. And Bob was in Europe, if I recall, and he came home and saw what we were doing and kind of went crazy. And he was a self-taught electronics nut. And next thing you know, he's remodeling the basement. <laughs> And uh, his, his mom was fine with it. And um, before we knew it, we had a little drum booth and a control room. The rest of it was quite small, but Bob put that together and it was a four track in the days that there was no such thing as a home studio. Right. There was no such thing as little equipment. So we had a board eventually that looked kind of like this one, like three quarters of it and a giant tape recorder down there <laughs> and huge fans on the back wall of the control room, one going in and one going out. Otherwise, we just cook <laughs> with the equipment. And, you know, Bruce Coburn used to come there to do his demos for his record. Mm -hmm. And um, Rafi recorded his first kids album there. That's great. Right at the last of it uh, when we were moving in here. So it was actually, it ended up being mixed here, but it was, uh, it was recorded there. Which one was that? Singable songs for the very young, and I was the bass player. Oh, okay. My <laughs> my grandmother actually knew Rafi at somehow when I was really little. Yeah. And they gave me a signed copy of that, the Beluga Whale yeah, album. That was done here too. Was it? Yeah, my yeah. grandma knew him at that time, and I got a signed copy oh, of cool. it. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about the studio in Ancaster, and then that leads us to here, Grant Avenue Studios. Um, which maybe you would call this the house that Bob built. Oh, absolutely. He, he literally built it. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about how Grant Studios came to be and really Bob's, you know, how, what did he do here? Well, it was the brothers who owned it and yeah. they, they were looking for a new location to expand. And at one point it was, you know, maybe go to Toronto and everybody agreed, we don't want to spend our lives in a car, so let's just stay in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. So they looked at different locations, eventually came up with this, which was a house that someone had converted into an office temporarily, but it still had the remaining walls. And they bought it and Dan, or uh, Bob took over uh, uh, about a year of his time and uh, gutted this whole floor and, and created this whole thing. Like he designed every square inch of it and he had never been in a studio before. That was the hilarious part of it. And he got everything not only right, it's, it's actually perfection. Like, uh, even when he was having all of this installed, he decided to go with really extra inputs so that we wouldn't run out in time. Well, I still am not out. <laughs> like I still don't have any problem hooking something up or yeah. complex stuff because there's so many connections. So he did this whole thing with one uh, person helping him over the course of a year. So nowadays you would, if you were to contract someone out to build this, you'd be looking at engineers, like people with actual education and, and training in, in sound engineering and... Yes, and they wouldn't necessarily get it right. <laughs> and that can be seen when you look at, I won't mention the concert hall in Toronto, but right. it was sort of computer designed and it is a dreadful place. It sounds like you've got earplugs in. Mm -hmm. Yet Massey Hall, you know, yeah. turn of the century, and it was just, it's perfection. I was just there uh, Saturday night to see the light opening. It, yeah. And it was just perfect. You know? That's great. So he, so he did all this without a degree, self-taught. Totally, basically. yeah. And including all the electronics, yeah. you know, like mm -hmm. he knew that stuff inside out or taught himself. That's a really impressive. But I think the coolest story when it comes to this, because it is, is I think I, I mentioned it before, is the most unnoticed part is people comment on these walls sometimes and mm -hmm. how lovely they are. Well, they're cork bark and he picked this to put on the wall, 
But this is Bob Lanois in a nutshell. When it comes to you, you get a one foot tile with nine squares in it. Right. Well, he started putting them up and found them very distracting. So he stopped and he went to the library and spent a few days studying abstract. Okay. And what it does when you have confronted or are looking at something with linear walls, etc., your eyes become drawn to it. But with abstract, you don't see it, you look past it. Right. Now, when you're in here looking out at a singer having a bad day, you really, really do want eye to eye contact. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be looking at the walls and distracted. So, what he did is he came back here and he got a table with a T square on it. And he took all of these tiles and randomly cut them with a skill knife right. and broke them all into little pieces. And he started over there and started working his way around. And this whole thing is done one piece at a time. Now, when you do look out at the drum booth, you never see this right. until you, I point mm -hmm. it out to you. Yeah, yeah. And that's Bob Lanois in a nutshell. He came up with this concept, studied it, and then came in here and did it. And it, it's probably the most unnoticed, which was his intention, <laughs> uh, part of the building is, you know, it's just there. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. So tell me what it was about working with Bob in this space before he moved on. Um, well, he was always on the money. He was mm -hmm. always coming up with cool ideas. You know, at one point he thought when they still, they owned it for nine years right. up until 85. Yeah. And, you know, at one point he decided that it would be really cool for the Toronto clients as if we had a big old limo and a driver to pick the people up. So mm -hmm. at one point he bought a real 60s Cadillac limousine, <laughs> uh, like a stretch limousine, and hired a person to drive once in a while. And he'd pick up the clients and it, they thought, you know, mm -hmm. this was pretty special. And he was always <laughs> coming up with kind of, I'll, I'll call them wacky ideas, but they were actually really, really smart ideas. You know, they were just really abstract. They were like yeah. right out there. That's great. Um, so tell me about some of the things he did. We talked about the um, the sand in the in the in the walls or in the mirrors. You talked about hanging microphones. Uh, so tell tell me, and I'm gonna do I'm gonna get B-roll of the things that you're talking about okay. while we walk around. So tell okay. me about some of the customizing that Bob did to make this space unique and what it is. Well, number one, Dan and I were working in Toronto all the time. Mm -hmm. I was bass, he was uh, guitar or mm -hmm. steel guitar. And when you're working in those studios, they're like bunkers. There's no windows. You go in at noon, you come out, it's dark out, and you have no idea what time of day it is. You know, you're just working. And when you come out and it's pitch dark, you've, you've lost something, that sense of your day. Yeah. So this place had these beautiful stained windows in it. And he decided to keep the windows. So he, boarded, he gutted all the, the glass and the wood out of the bottom. Mm -hmm. And he boarded it up with one inch plywood and filled it from the bottom to the top with sand. Okay. Now there's lead over top of that to, to, to further enhance the deadening qualities. Mm -hmm. But then he put layers of glass either side of the stained glass so we could have in the daylight these windows. Everybody comments how pretty they are. That's but great. more importantly, as the sun's going down, you feel it going down. <laughs> and that's, it seems like who cares? You're recording an album, get to work. But it, it's, it's a big deal, like, and it always has been for me. If right. it's a beautiful sunny day in the morning, the, the windows are just incredible with the sun on them. Right. And when it's a dark, dear, dr dingy day, you get that sense of it because everything's mm -hmm. kind of gray out there. Right. But it was, it was little things like that. Well, actually, they're really big things. They just look like little things. You right. Know? You come in, oh, you saved the glass. Most, most studios do not have any glass. Right. You know? Peter Gabriel tried it in his place with a big you know, a window that overlooked a meadow, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was absolutely glorious. But the ready lights on the two-inch tape recorder are little LEDs, and they frequently would roll <laughs> tape and not realize another track was kicked in. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right. There's no undo on two-inch tape recorders. Right. It's a totally different time. Uh, so tell, uh, did you ever hang out with Bob at his cabin? No. No, you didn't. Okay. Oh, one day. One yeah. day. Okay. Uh, when he first moved in there, there was a great big huge well, and I have always lived out in the country, so I had experience getting a well running. And, okay. And uh, that's actually a funny story. I showed up and drove up the driveway, and Bob's out there with this archery set. And I hadn't shot, I always had bows and arrows when I was a kid. Yeah. He says, want to try? I said, I haven't shot for a long time. 
I hauled back on this thing, and I shoot left-handed, so it's kind of clumsy. I hauled back on this thing. I didn't just hit the bullseye. I hit dead center on the bullseye. <laughs> and I, and I couldn't have done it in a million years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he thought that's enough of that. Um, so, so a couple. So now we're going to get a little bit deeper. Um, having having been gone for only seven months, um, what do you think is the void that's left in his passing? Well, for me, it's calling him up and getting on to some pretty crazy discussions uh, about recording equipment and, and philosophies on recording equipment and on recording, period. Yeah. And it was always like really enlightening. You know, I would say things to him that he kind of enjoyed and I, he definitely said things to me that I enjoyed and mm -hmm. it was always just good fun, you know. I mean, when I did some recarpeting once, there was a little piece of... Uh, um, cardboard shoved in an old heating vent and when I pulled it out then I find an acetate it was a the running master for Ian Thomas's record oh. <laughs> like like the first pr not pressing but the, the cutting yeah that you take home to reference and that thing was sitting there as a spacer <laughs> <laughs> so I would call him up and and complain yeah. you know about the warranty on the building you know <laughs> so I was always giving him a hard time with That's that. That's good. Now, so now we're going to talk a little bit about Bob's sort of legacy. And um, <clears throat> you, can, you can answer this <clears throat> however you want, whether it uh, relates to this building, to music in general, or to you. The question is, in your opinion, what is Bob's lasting impression or legacy in regards to Canadian music or music in general? Well, his legacy would right off the top of my head is there's a studio here that is still running and working and making Gordon Lightfoot records 45 years after he put it together. Mm -hmm. And it's really important when you, when you look at the thousands of recordings that have been done here. I mean, some you've never heard of, right. some you know all about, but they're really important pieces of Canadian history and more importantly, world music. Mm -hmm. like, like it's not restricted to, oh, look at us Canadians. I mean, there's there's songs that came out of here that have gone around the world many times. Yep. So probably the most important thing is he's he he did that, if nothing else in his life, if, if you were only gonna, if I was gonna pick one thing, then it would be that he created this environment for people to work and really be happy working. You know, people aren't happy working in all studios. Right. I mean, some more than others. But yeah. when people are here, they walk out really happy with what they've done because uh, he created the environment that made it work. 